Greetings! Welcome to our show, Ghosts Are Near, where we explore various aspects of the paranormal and paranormal research. I am your host, Keith Johnson, the founder of New England Anomalies Research. With me is my co-host, Sandra Johnson. Good evening. Also joined this evening by Lisa Dewallaby and Nathan Mayer. Hello. And this evening, we have a very exciting guest for you, Mike Barra. Mike Barra is an aeronautical engineer, author, lecturer, and TV personality. He describes himself as a born-again conspiracy theorist. He has written three books and an essay and has appeared on the History Channel TV series Ancient Aliens and America's Book of Secrets and currently on a new TV show called Uncovering Aliens. He's also appeared on Coast to Coast with George Norrie. Um, very, very recognizable character, and we look forward to talking to him. With no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Barra. <laughs> Hello, Mike. How are you doing? Good. I'm noticing how enormous my hands are. <laughs> well, they can be very, very enormous, especially when you're in front of the camera there. I love, to watch, I love to watch Monday Night Football because when the guy talks, when John Gruden motions, his hands get gigantic. It's amazing how huge his hands are. <laughs> we, we do the same thing here in New England, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so we do, we do understand. Okay, well, our first question. Can you tell us about your new program, Uncovering Aliens? It seems like you are looking for some hard evidence of aliens and alien visitations. Yeah, that's actually the theme of the program. It's uh, you know it's a reality show. I've got f uh, three other co-stars: myself, Maureen Ellsbury, who is a sort of a UFO journalist, blogger type. I've got Daryl Sims, who is the alien hunter. He's from Texas. He's uh, got a lot of experience with abductions. He's had not so great encounters with aliens himself. And then there's Stephen Jones, who's English, and he's uh, from um, he's had from, from a different school. He's kind of got a positive outlook or view of the extraterrestrials and the four of us together have kind of gone out and investigated a bunch of different UFO cases and uh, so far we've shot four episodes and um, actually we've actually shot five four have aired one of them looks like it's gonna kinda get cut up because the guy turned out to be not the best witness <laughs> <laughs> although I'm really upset about that because in that particular episode while we were testing something he had claimed Maureen actually fell on her rear end I mean just fell right on her butt on camera and everything and we're not going to use that now so I'm upset about that but um, essentially the show is a reality program where I play kind of the skeptic and in fact you know I am I am skeptical in the sense that most people that claim that they're skeptics are actually debunkers they're not skeptics a skeptic is someone who reserves judgment until all the facts are in and then you make a judgment at that point and and that's kind of the way I am so it really suits me very well to be the guy who's kind of questioning everything on the show and it's aired let's see the pilot aired on Animal Planet, which was the original network, uh, three times in December, and did pretty well, very well in the ratings, actually, and then it's aired since then on Wednesday nights twice, the last two Wednesday nights, they've had kind of uh, Uncovering Aliens marathons on the Science Channel, Discovery Science. Discovery owns a whole bunch of networks, Animal Planet being the original one, and so we don't know where we're going to end up. They're, they're in conversations right now, trying to decide how that show's going to go, and I suspect we'll be doing some more pretty soon, and that's going to be a show where we're really going to dig into things that are kind of out of my, um, not my comfort zone, but kind of out of my normal range of, of stuff that I work on. It's, it's true um, extraterrestrial abduction cases and things like that that we're going to be investigating. So it's been a lot of fun so far, and I hope it continues. Well, great. We happened to view that pilot episode, and we were very impressed. I thought it was excellent. Very, very well done. Appreciate that. I, I was impressed with everything except the size of my gut, but beyond that. <laughs> hey, we're all working on it. It's just past the holidays. Oh, I understand you have a new, new book coming out, and it's uh, about the possibility of aliens on Mars. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, actually, the book is already out. It's called Ancient Aliens on Mars. It's been released, and it's doing pretty well. It's for David Hatcher Childress's um, Adventures Unlimited Press who's one of my favorite guys from the Ancient Aliens shows. And uh, it's essentially about the 
reality of extraterrestrial ruins, artifacts of an ancient civilization on the planet Mars. And in fact, there's so much stuff on Mars to talk about that I'm actually working on the sequel already because there's just not enough was not enough space in, in one book to cover everything that I came across. So it goes back to stuff like the like Sidonia, the face on Mars, the pyramids that are there, Carl Sagan's pyramids of Elysium are covered. Um, an awful lot of other structures and things on the, on the surface of Mars, but the, the main focus is actually the, the, the so-called face on Mars, and just basically discussing back and forth all of the arguments about that that have gone on for decades, really, for over 30 years, and the reality that, you know, NASA's arguments that this is not artificial have pretty much completely fallen apart. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of interesting stuff you can talk about about the face, and that ended up kind of dominating the book. It actually went a little bit... Um, you know, deeper into that than I expected. I thought the face was going to be a certain segment of the book and we're going to move on to other things, but I'm not even done with it. I, I didn't even get it all in. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm now moving on and adding a few more things in, in Ancient Aliens on Mars 2, which is going to be coming out this year, 2014, and um, moving forward and continuing the story. Well, you mentioned NASA. Um, can you talk a little bit more uh, about NASA and, and what you think they may or may not be hiding? Well, NASA, most people don't realize, is not actually a civilian science, science agency. They pretend that they are a civilian science agency, but in reality they're a division of, of the Defense Department. They always have been from the very beginning. It was designed that way. And the structure was set up from the very beginning in the act that actually created NASA so that anything that they found that might be of, quote, national security interest could be classified by the DOD before it ever went out to the public. And that's pretty much what we've seen on a pretty consistent basis from them. They also commissioned a report back in the late 1950s called, it's just commonly called the Brookings Report. And it essentially is a report for what they should do in space when they got out there and the things that they might find. And one of the things that the Brookings Report talked about was it talked about the fact that you're probably not going to meet E.T. face to face, which, you know, I think there's some people that would debate whether that's taken place or not, but that they very well might find what the, the report described as artifacts. And artifacts are extraterrestrial ruins, ruins on another planet, it specifically stated Venus, the moon, and Mars. And so far we've got a lot of pictures of the moon and a lot of pictures on, of Mars, and I would say it's pretty much a a given that we have ruins, artifacts of ancient extraterrestrial civilizations on both of those worlds. Now, the really interesting thing about the Brookings Report is that it basically goes on to say to NASA, hey, look, if you guys find this stuff, if you do find artifacts or ruins, you should seriously consider not telling the public about it, because if you do, it will probably drive everybody crazy, and our economy will collapse, society will become, you know, kind of a disaster area, and everybody will basically just sit around and become pot-smoking slackers, which actually is kind of what's happened anyway. <laughs> yeah. The Brookings Report, one other thing that's really always fascinating to me about the Brookings Report is that it was the basis for the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Stanley Kubrick could quote from the Brookings Report chapter and verse. I mean, he knew everything about it, and the whole film is set up as kind of a cautionary tale to tell people, you know, look, if they find stuff, when they go to the moon, they aren't going to tell you, and you have to force them to to release it. And so far, unfortunately, we've really not had a lot of luck with that. Um, a lot of pictures have leaked out. A lot of pictures have slipped through the cracks that have really interesting things on it. But I still think there's a lot of stuff that's left uncovered, and I would like to uncover that data at some point, although I don't know if I'm ever going to get the chance. So you're not worried about everyone going crazy um, I worry about the guys that work for NASA going crazy because, you know, the people that – really, it's interesting. When you get into this – I don't want to call it an industry, but when you get into this vocation and you talk about, you know, these kinds of subjects, the kinds of subjects that you and your audience are interested in and I'm interested in, you invariably develop critics. And these critics are usually from the NASA side of things, and they – just want to convince the whole world that everything on those pictures is nothing but a simple crater that was created by a rock that came down and hit the surface. And, you know, I mean, the bottom line is craters, meteors do not create faces on Mars. They do not create pyramids. They do not create all the things we've seen. And these people are just blind. I mean, I will go into these arguments back and forth, and they will say, they will make, you know, 0 0.12, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 
0.3. And I will say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And I will show them that. And they just refuse to go there. I mean, they actually have to accuse people like me and Richard Hoagland and others that have done this work of fabricating stuff. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, the reality is there's so many anomalies. There's so many things on these pictures that do not belong there, that are structural and not not natural formations that in my, in my case, I, I don't have enough time to go through all of them. I mean, there's so many things, I don't even have time to look at them and talk about all of them. The idea that I would have to fabricate something is, is because I just, there's so many strange things on Mars and strange things on the moon that I just, you know, I don't have time to fabricate anything. But the fact that they would go there tells me, and this is a really long answer to a very short question, um, the fact that they would go there tells me that they are true believers. You know, they are basically really embedded in, in a hierarchy and in the hierarchy that, of the worldview that they have. You know, they're really important because they're the smartest guys because they're the scientists and they work for NASA and they get their funding from NASA. And I think anything, anybody that comes along and says, wow, you guys are not, look at that. Well, look at what's on that picture. You know, what, what about this? Anybody who challenges that. It's treated kind of like a heretic. So in a sense, the engineers and the scientists that should be leading us on this quest are the people that are the most resistant to it. And it's really a shame because science is supposed to be a search for the truth. It's not supposed to be about defending the old ideas. It's not supposed to be about defending dogmas that have served their purpose at their day and no longer fit. Now, in Dark Mission, it discusses how President Kennedy may actually have been assassinated because he was about to leak out some information on actual UFOs that the government knew about. Uh, do you think there were those involved with government at the time that would have gone that far to that level? Yeah, I do. And, uh, you know, this is really interesting because the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination was just this past November 50th, I think. Yeah, right. And... Um, and I, um, I went back over that material and republished it on my blog and so forth. And, you know, it was, I'm not saying he was killed because of what he was about to reveal. Well, what I argued with Hoagland, and I was really, to be honest, that, that part of the book was primarily driven by my ideas about the assassination, was that, you know, he wasn't necessarily going to reveal things. What he was going to do is he was going to share the moon with the Russians. He was going to share whatever we found with the Russians. And I think that all of the things that he had done to that point where he printed silver certificates right out of the Treasury, for instance, he bypassed the Federal Reserve. He had done things that the CIA, pissed the CIA off. He had done things to humiliate Lyndon Johnson, um, you know, who was a Freemason. There were, there were all these different things going on at the time. And, you know, the question was once asked by a writer, it, you know, the question isn't who wanted to kill JFK. The question was who didn't want to kill JFK. But I think the last straw was documents that he put out, these actual national security memorandums that had basically said to the, to the, uh, the American um, intelligence establishment that we've now reached an agreement with the Soviets and we are going to go to the moon together and I'm now instructing you to open up an office to start transferring our information. And I think that was the last straw. That was what really got him killed at that point. Uh, was that the reason he was killed? No, there's a 50,000 50, reasons why Kennedy was killed. Um, but that was the last straw, I will say that. Um, and I think that, that it's more about that they were afraid of sharing what we would find on the moon. Because I think that deep in these intelligence agencies, they understood that what they were going to find was extraterrestrial ancient alien archaeology or uh, ancient alien technology. And I think that was really what they were afraid of, the Russians getting their hands on. Lisa? I was wondering what your opinion was regarding many people's opinion that we never really did go to the moon. A lot of people say it's a, a big hoax. Yeah, in my last book, um, excuse me, in my last book, <laughs> um, Ancient Alien on the Moon, I covered that. I've covered it, we've covered it before in Dark Mission, and, you know, I don't, I don't believe that. I think we, cl we clearly did go. I, what's happening to my mind is I go through the evidence. I think just basically all the arguments do not measure up. They don't add up. They don't fit. They don't survive the scrutiny of going through them in depth. What I think is happening is that people are seeing an awful lot of secrecy that doesn't make a lot of sense. They're seeing things that don't quite add up, and they're coming to the conclusion that, oh, we never went to the moon at all, as opposed to coming to the correct conclusion, which is that we went, but we're covering up what we were doing. I mean, there's a 
Great example I go through on Ancient Aliens on the Moon of Apollo 17 where they go to an area underneath a, a hexagonal mountaintop which was called the, the North Massif. And they go to this area which is a depression that, you, that looks like you can go inside the thing underneath it. They park the lunar rover right above that. They get out of the rover and then the camera, which is controlled for mission control, pans around at everything except what the astronauts are doing for about the next 25 or 30 minutes. And, you know, that to me is what was the real secret that they were really covering up. So people see this secrecy, they see this stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense, and they, um, <laughs> and they, sorry about that, guys, and they, um, you know, they, they come to the conclusion that NASA wants them to come to, which is that there's some big conspiracy that we never went to the moon. And I think that that was a straw man conspiracy. We talk about that in Dark Mission, where the guys who really put that meme into the culture was NASA themselves back in the late 1960s, before all Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins had even splashed down. They were, they were giving people grand tours around the press room at JPL, where he was handing out leaflets saying the whole thing was faked in a movie studio. So I think what it is is it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a chess move that was set up in the late 1960s to get people to believe in that, because then whenever anybody says they're a conspiracy theorist about the moon, Everybody's going to go, oh, you think we never went, which is, of course, an idiotic conspiracy because most of the data is idiotic. But they, get you to, they want you to believe in that argument, which is easily shot down, as opposed to the real conspiracy, which was to cover up what we did, why we went there, and what we brought back. Nathan. What's your favorite American landmark that has hidden secrets or mysteries behind it, and why? My favorite American landmark. Well, that's a question I was kind of... You caught me off guard on that one. Um, I think it would have to be the Washington Monument. And I think that the reason why is because it was it's, it's Masonic. It's set up in a square where it is aligned at certain angles with other monuments in Washington, D.C., which is very interesting. It is an Egyptian obelisk, which is sort of an energy antenna gatherer. And it's really interesting... Things have happened around the monument that are, are really fascinating. And of course, Washington made no secret of the fact that he was a Freemason. But what's really interesting is, for instance, when Barack Obama took his first oath of office back in 2009, he, um, he messed up the oath of office. He didn't say it correctly. And so they had to... Now, what's really interesting about that is that that inauguration, which has to be on that date, was scheduled under what's called a void of course moon. And in astrology, that is the worst portent that you can have for any endeavor that you begin. So he actually screwed up the, um, the oath. And then the next day, he had to take it again, about 7.30 in the White House, after the void of course moon had passed. And he did it in a room in the White House, which actually looked directly out, pointing directly to the Washington Monument. So he took his oath on a Masonic Bible, pointing out to a Masonic <laughs> Egyptian obelisk, which, you know, all this stuff goes back to the the ancient Egyptian, Egyptian civilization, which the Freemasons believe is the, the source civilization of the human race, and basically is a, a civilization that was, that was created by extraterrestrials who came here. So all the symbolism that's involved with it just continues on to this day, and to me that's the most fascinating one that we have, monument that we have. Do you think the Ma Masons are holding some information about alien life? Yeah, I think, well... I, I, I don't know. I don't have access to the book. You know, I'm sure they've got a book somewhere that's got all the information in it, but I don't know what that is. Um, I suspect that's what the so-called Templar treasure was that they were trying to recover from under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem back in the 1100s. It eventually made its way to Scotland and then eventually from Scotland to what is now Oak Island on, uh, in, in New Scotland or Nova Scotia. So the Templar treasure I don't think is like the Ark of the Covenant. I think it's the secret papers that tell the true history of the human race. And it's pretty obvious to me at this point that the true history as they see it is that we're all descended from this, these extraterrestrials who came here a long time ago, at least thousands of years ago, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago, kind of along the lines of the work of Zechariah Sitchin. And th clearly that's what they believe. Clearly that's what they're hiding. I think they do have a lot more information than they're sharing. And it's to me, it's fascinating because... I'd love to get my hands on that book. I don't think I'm ever going to. But I'd love to know what, the, what their version of, of the truth is. You know, I, at this point, I try to take a piece from over here, a piece from over there. 
some of Sitchin's work, the late Lloyd Pye's work, things like that, and put them all together. And to me, that that's the big picture. And you know, the, the the fact is, we go back to the space program. We go back to Mars and the Moon and the Apollo lunar missions, and they were all run basically by the Freemasons. The Freemasons had complete control of of the American space program, especially in the 1960s. And you know, one of the things we talked about in Dark Mission is that you you essentially had these three groups. We called them the Masons, the Magicians, and, and the Nazis. And they were all secret societies. They all worshipped the ancient Egyptian gods Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And um, they all had basically the core same sort of occulted belief systems. So I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that was a good answer. answer it. Yes. <laughs> you gotta, you got to stop me or I'm just going to go on a roll. No, we want that. I <laughs> um, wanted to ask you about the Mayans. I know okay. you had written a book regarding the Mayan apocalypse. And um, do you feel as though the Mayans have a direct link to extraterrestrial life? I don't know about that. I do know that, that the Mayans, this is my this is my second book, The Choice, that you're talking about. And what what I do know and do believe about the Mayan civilization is that it was very advanced for its time. It had certainly new things that we no longer know, understood how to use energies and, and natural forces, manipulate them in a way that we can't really seem to do that and can't seem to do anymore. And one of the things I talked about in the choice was that you know, there, are, there are Hindu myths about source fields, source energies that the earth was once aligned with that it is no longer aligned with. We're like in a dark cloud. We've been in a dark cloud for a couple thousand years and we can't connect to that. And I think that that gave them a certain intuitive knowledge that has gone by the wayside the last few thousand years. During the occulted age of Pisces, we've kind of lost that. And now the only knowledge we trust is what we have in our heads as opposed to what we have in our hearts. And I think they they knew things with their hearts the way that we know things with our heads. And that gave them the ability to manipulate structures and build these incredible pyramids and things that they built and, and know about astronomy and astrology to a, a really a, a great degree. So was that knowledge extraterrestrial? Probably at its root that knowledge is extraterrestrial. I do believe in the ancient alien theory. But whether the Mayans are a sub-civilization or whether they were in direct contact or not, I, I don't know. I, my sense is, was, and what I wrote in the choice was that, you know, they are kind of a subset, a sub-civilization. In other words, this information was passed down to them. It wasn't that they had direct contact. Many of the many of the tombs and the glyphs, a lot of people have interpreted as, like, the tomb at Pakal and Palenque, they think that he's being lifted up into an alien yeah. ship. I yeah. wondered what your thoughts were about that. Um, again, it could be things that they actually saw, or it could be things that, that they were told about and, and depicted from stories that they had been told, from origin myths that they had been told. Um, I don't know. And the thing is, is that um, at, by the time the Mayans sprung up, which was actually kind of around the time of Christ, it wasn't really that much much older than that, they were... They were they came from a previous earlier civilization. I believe it was the Taltex. So you got to go back to those root civilizations and see what they believed and what their origin stories are to really get to the bottom of that. But there's no question that they embedded in stone as a message that would last for the thousands of years that it needed to last the stories of where they came from. And I think we have no reason to disbelieve their origin stories. Um, I don't take them as myths. You know, again, Mythology is my story. History is his story. So which story are you going to trust to be more accurate? You know, more mine, yours, or somebody else's? And that's kind of the way I've always looked at it. Now, Mike, being yourself an aeronautical engineer, I'd like to ask you, what personal experiences have you had with UFOs? Any yeah. real personal up-close encounters or, or what? I have never had any until um, I got involved with the Uncovering Aliens show, and since then I've had, I've had two. The first was in New York City. They brought us um, in May of 2012 to New York City to shoot what they call a sizzle reel, which is basically a proof of concept. They spend a weekend, several days, to shoot everybody. They had seven or eight candidates, some other people that didn't make it on the show that I really loved, and... Um, they shoot everybody, and they pick from that what the cast is going to be, who, who the cast members are going to be. And we were um, second or third night. They had us in a nice hotel in Brooklyn, which is really a nice place now, by the way. And I was, you know, sitting on the roof with a couple of the girls in the cast, and there was a bar up there, and we were, we were having some beers, you know, a couple. And this, this 
thing comes spinning into the into the sky about a block, a block and a half away. And it's large and it's rotating. It has a, it's an amber color. It has sort of an aquamarine internal structure and it's counter rotating the other way. I, I just, I've never seen anything like it. And, you know, it's weird because I always kind of, I kind of reached the conclusion I was never going to see one. Like I had some block on or something. And it was just really extraordinary. It, it seemed more like energy than it seemed like a, an actual structured craft. But it hovered there for a bit gave us a few seconds. By the time we really sorted out that this was really something weird and you know, got our cameras out, it then started to move off, and it moved off in a, in a straight line um, out over the city and disappeared. So that was really unusual. The other time was um, in Sedona, where we were actually shooting the pilot episode, which is the um, Black Ops conspiracy episode, which is the pilot for the show. Um, at night, you know, we were using night vision cameras and equipment, and we had been up there for about two hours, and our local guide told us, you know, well, you're not going to see any satellites after after about, you know, an hour. The sun goes down below the horizon, and they're not they're not illuminated, so you won't see any. So we'd been there for a couple hours. We'd seen all kinds of planes and helicopters and satellites and things that were easily identifiable and easily identifiable as terrestrial. And we were just about getting ready to wrap it up, and Stephen Jones, the Englishman, you know, called called out to his friends to come and visit us, and Right above him, instantly, three objects appeared in a triangle formation, dead stopped, and then they begin to move. And they moved, sort of, one went this way, two went that way, and they all went off in other directions very slowly. They were very high up, I think, because they were, they appeared, they, they would have had to have been self-luminous. They did not have any strobe lights. They were not aviation. You know, I, I know enough about planes to know that they were not planes. They were not helicopters. There was no sound. They were very high up, and... It was a truly bizarre, strange experience, and it's like they definitely appeared when Stephen called them, and they allowed us to film them, and then they just disappeared. So, you know, I mean, the only way that they could have been satellites, terrestrial satellites, would be if three satellites were able to stop in orbit over the Earth, um, form a triangle, and then begin to move, and um, all at the same time over the exact same location where just by chance we happen to be filming, which, you know, again, I've kind of... I discount that. Just possibly. happened to be there at the right right <laughs> moment. Yeah. Yeah. Despite what some MUFON types might have to say about it, I discount that possibility pretty much, you know, on, on the on face value. So those are two weird, weird experiences, and those are the only two so far. And Frank, listening to Stephen and Daryl, I hope those are the only two direct encounters that I have. No. You never know. But about your experiences working on ancient aliens, could you talk a little more about that and how they contact you? When it's something of your specialty, how does that come about? Well, for instance, you know, what happens is a producer who I've worked with before or who has been, um, I've been recommended to by one of the other producers I've worked with on the show will give me and send me an email, give me a call and say, hey, we're doing an episode on Mars, for instance. There's going to be a Mars episode coming up, which is great timing for a guy who just wrote a book about Mars. Um, and they say, you know, do you want to come on the show and talk about this? And I was like, yeah, sure. So usually we set up... Um, an interview process where <clears throat> I'll go down there and I'll be, they usually shoot three or four guys in one day if they can. And um, they will go, we'll go to the same location. They, they fly me down. They put me up in a nice hotel. I hang out with Giorgio or whoever else might be there. And then we go on and, and shoot and they just run from a list of questions they have. So it's, it's a pretty straightforward process. It's a talking head kind of thing, sort of like this. And they just basically have me say, you know, whatever's on my mind, and ask me the questions, and I give them my opinions. If it fits with what the show wants to be the focus of that episode, then they use the sound bite. If it doesn't fit, they don't use it. So there's a lot of good ancient alien stuff that's on the cutting room floor, as far as I'm concerned. That's good. So, so are yeah. you going to come around this neck of the woods soon? Because uh, we're having a lot more sightings around here, believe it or not, in uh, right here in our locale in uh, New England, Warwick, Rhode Island. We're having, we're having a lot more reports of uh, these big booms and UFO sightings. It's getting pretty active about here. Well, if somebody wants to fly me out to the Super Bowl this weekend, I'd be glad to swing up to New England. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, no, I don't have any plans at the moment, although, you know, I do enjoy the East Coast. I've lived out, I've lived in Toronto before, and I've traveled around the East Coast. And I, I've been to Boston um, once, I think, just once. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to come out there, but, um, but at the moment, no plans. Do you have any thoughts on the Masons, that the fact that many NASA, including Buzz Aldrin, etc., are 
third degree Masons? Yeah, there were um, there were an awful lot of Masons at NASA in the 1960s. There still are today, but it was really really prevalent back then. The the director um, of the of the Apollo and Mercury and Gemini projects was a guy named um, Ken Kleinconnect. His brother was C. Fred Kleinconnect, who was the head of the Scottish Rite 33rd degree Freemasons throughout the entire world. So they basically their brother. You know, and of course, Masons call themselves each other brother. So the brother of one of the brothers was running all the NASA space programs. Most of the astronauts were Freemasons. I have not been able to find out whether Neil Armstrong was or not, but I do know that Buzz Aldrin was. And he was not only a third um, degree Master Mason, but he was also a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, which is a sort of separate organization. And that's what they all seem to be at NASA was this particular Scottish Rite. Now... We know that the, the, the Freemasonry Scottish Rite only goes to 33 degrees. You can take all the degrees up to 32, but you have to actually be asked to join, asked to join the, thir- the 33rd degree, which is where all the really cool stuff is. Buzz uh, went to the moon with Neil, and he took along a Masonic apron, a, a, tr- a sort of traditional uh, Masonic apron, which is used in our ceremonies with him, with him on the lunar module. He wore his Masonic ring instead of his wedding ring in the lunar module. There's a very famous picture of Buzz in the module with sort of putting something in his pocket, and you can see his ring. And he basically, you know, showed, tried to show his ring at all times. In, the, in a lot of the crew pictures, for instance, it's always cropped, so you can't see his hand because he stuck his Freemason ring, uh, Freemasonry ring right out there for everybody to see. And what most people don't know is that he actually performed a Masonic ceremony, which is a tribute to the god Osiris which was masquerading as a communion ceremony on the moon with Neil Armstrong before they went out on their first moonwalk, exactly 33 minutes after they landed. He did this with the constellation of Orion, which represented the Egyptian god Osiris, which is what the Freemasons worship, at a particular point in the sky above the landing site. And all this stuff was arranged. He took this, he brought back the apron, brought it back to uh, to. Uh, Washington, D.C., to the Scottish Rite headquarters, presented it. I believe it's still there, and he was then thereafter made a 33rd-degree Scottish Rite Freemason. And the last thing I think is really interesting about all this stuff that happened is that most people don't realize that the pictures from Apollo 11 are all of Buzz Aldrin. There are no pictures of Neil Armstrong. Not pictures. There's film, but there's no pictures of Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. And the, the traditional explanation for that is that, well, Neil had the camera. Well, they could have either one of them could have used the camera, but all the pictures were there. And I think the reason Neil Armstrong actually went out first was so that he could take all of these famous photos of Buzz descending the ladder. Basically, his job was to document the first Freemason on the moon. And I think that basically Apollo 11 was set up as a temple, sort of a consecration of the moon itself by the Freemasons. I think that was their ultimate goal for the first mission. Apollo 11, and then we went on to other goals on other missions after that. So it's uh, the the depth of the penetration of Freemasonry into the American space program is really profound, and and goes really really deeply into the all the stuff that they were doing, especially back in the seas. Mm-hmm. I understand, and it's it's almost it almost replicates General George Washington and the first inauguration and the famous painting of him with all the. Masonic paraphernalia and everything like that. It's like coming into the new generation, the new millennia, going ahead, and, and yeah, I see exactly how that follows. And The American tradition is really a Masonic tradition, and it's, that's the part of our history we don't really discuss very much or very often on the open. And some would say dating back to the Anunnaki, of course, dating back mm-hmm. all to prehistory and throughout our many generations of human history and prehistory. So. Yeah, I think these Egyptian gods were actually either Anunnaki themselves or they were demigods. They were direct descendants of the Anunnaki, one of the two. Mm-hmm. But they were, the, they were the, the, or the fathers of the Egyptian civilization, which I think the, Mis- the Masons look at as sort of the, the root of human civilization. Mm-hmm. Do you feel as though Akhenaten had a role in that? I know he worshipped the sun god and he was viewed as a heretic. Do you feel like he ties into that whole alien civilization? Yeah, I do. Although that's more the that's more the purview of people like William Henry, who you know that he really gets deeply into that. I just tried to focus on the obvious stuff within NASA, which is Isis, Osiris, and Horus. That's the main ones that NASA was focused on. So Akhenaten, sure, he's part of it. Um, uh, what's his name? Toth, who was the architect. 
it's part of the whole process, but uh, that's not really, I don't really go there that <laughs> go there that deeply. Sorry. Cats that. were considered divine in ancient That's Egypt. So yeah, 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 of course. This one's this one's divine. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I, I want to ask you something. Do you ever ever feel just a little apprehensive about maybe going too far and covering a little too much that somebody may say you're going a little too far? It's time to to hush this info up doesn't belong to the general public or what's your what's your opinion of that no i don't i've never had any resistance or pushback like that at all on anything i've ever done so i don't really um i've never had that experience so i can't say that i really worry about it it seems like you know it's really interesting do you guys know who jordan maxwell is heard of him yes okay jordan maxwell is, i call him the patron saint of conspiracy theory because he hates the church okay but he is he told me once that he was told by guys in the club that as long as people are hearing you but not listening to you, it's not a problem. If they start listening to you, it's a problem. And I guess what this means is that people aren't really listening to me. So <laughs> I haven't had any problems at this point, uh, although I would like to put it out there that I'm willing to be bought off. So. <laughs> Mike, if viewers want to uh, contact you, how would they go about doing so, if they're there's interested in your ways. work? Sorry, there's multiple ways to do that. Um, my ha I have a blog, which is mikebarra.blogspot.com, and it's just one R, B-A-R-A, -A, so mikebarra.blogspot.com is my, my blog, and through that, you can get links to me on Facebook. Um, I have... I have a regular Facebook account, but it's got like 5,000 friends, so it's maxed out, but I do have an author page. So they can connect with me there. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at MikeBarra33, just to sort of make the conspiracy people a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I got this I got, I got got this when I started the Uncovering Alien show. Oh, that so, is cool. <laughs> I like that. So you can connect with me on Twitter at, at MikeBarra33, or you can actually go to my YouTube channel and subscribe to my videos. I haven't uploaded videos in a while, but I've got a lot of things coming out. So I put up videos of lectures and different things that I do like that. So um, those are the main ways to connect with me. And, you know, I'm, I'm as, about as social on social media as anybody can be. Does anyone else have any questions you'd like to ask? No, I think we're good. Okay. Well, Mike, you've been a wonderful guest. And now people can also find you on Ghosts Are Near. And <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Yeah. We hope to have you on again. Thank you. You've been a wonderful guest. This has been fascinating. We very, very much look forward to your new show and your upcoming books. And uh, stay with it, man. We'll talk to you again very soon. Okay. And we're listening. We are listening. I think they may be on to us, but yeah, yes. All right. Take care, Mike.